There are no rules to writing anything. There's an old uh, English writer called W. Somerset Maugham. He said the only things that you need for writing are paper and a pen and a will to use them. When you lose yourself in an academic analysis of writing, you stop writing. Uh, I think all creative faculties are like a muscle. The more you use them, the stronger they get. And the only way, really, to learn writing is to write. Um, you write, and then you write, and you write some more. And it's a process that can continue for the entirety of your career, professionally or just purely for love. Um, I speak to writers who read things that they wrote six months ago and they say it was dreadful, it was terrible. It wasn't. It just means that you've become a better writer. If you wrote something six months ago and then you read it and you cannot see how you can improve it, it means that in that six month period you have not made any progress. I have no academic qualifications. I did not study at school, I did not go to college, I did not go to university, I didn't study English. Um, I just decided that I wanted to write and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I think after 50,000 or 100,000 or 250,000 words or three books or four books or five books you discover a style that is your own and the way in which you want to express things. I think all too easily people fall into the idea that you need to find inspiration, that you need to study the mechanics of something, but often just the writing itself can be inspirational. Um, and I think the success of any endeavour, whether you're an athlete or a choreographer or a painter or you're an architect or you're a photographer, is simply to do the action of the creative impulse that you have. Listen, read, study, learn, but always put it into practice. And I think, in all honesty, that's the best way to write. Honestly, I think the biggest influences in my narrative style come from film. They don't come from literature. When I was a child, I was orphaned at a very early age, and I was sent to an orphanage for nine years. My grandmother was my maternal guardian and for a few weeks each year she would, uh, I would go and stay with her. She didn't know what to do with, uh, with a young child so she said it's okay for you to watch the television but you can only watch things that were made before the year of your birth which was 1965. So in this way I discovered the golden age of Hollywood. I discovered Bogart and Bacall. I discovered the work of Hitchcock. You take a film like Strangers on a Train, which is based on a book by Patricia Highsmith with a screenplay that was written by Raymond Chandler, directed by Alfred Hitchcock, and you have an extraordinary piece of storytelling. So when I write, I think in pictures. I think in pictures and emotions. I don't plan a book. I don't write an outline. I don't write a synopsis. I think about the emotion I want to create, and I begin with a very simple idea, and I allow the story and the characters to develop in a sort of a natural way. In my opinion there are no rules for writing. I think this is proven. There was a series of books that was published in England many years ago and they were selected interviews from the Paris Literary Review. Very, very interesting. Interviews by people like Kurt Vonnegut, John Steinbeck, Truman Capote, even William Wyler for writing film and screen. And you read just a handful of those interviews and you begin to understand that no writer works in the same way. Some are precise, meticulous, they plan everything in advance. Some are very organic and spontaneous and they just rush at it as if it's a battle of words. The way that you write is the way that you write. If you have to write in silence, it's okay. If you have to write with headphones on playing death metal, that's okay. If you have to get drunk before you can write, that's okay. You probably won't last very long, 
But whichever way you write and whichever way you feel is comfortable for you to write is the best way for you to write. And it's a personal activity. But again, I think of a creative faculty as a muscle. The more you do it, the stronger it gets. Your paints, your, your canvas are words and pages. Uh, create images. Set yourself exercises. Think of a single word. And then with that word as an inspiration, write a paragraph. Have a conversation with somebody. Come back and write out your understanding of that conversation. But put some imaginary emotions in it. Or give the dialogue to some other character. Something that you do that exercises your capacity to think and exercises your capacity to write all the time. How do you create tension is probably one of the most common questions that we are asked, certainly in the genre. The answer is usually given. You write in such a way that the reader has to find out what happens next. This doesn't answer the question. It does not answer the question. Because how do you write in such a way as to make the reader want to read what happens next? I think that you do it with character. I think that you do it by investing yourself in a character, investing emotions in a character, because if you portray a character with honesty and credibility, you will find that your reader identifies and emotionally engages with that character. If you think of the 10 most important books in your life, you often think of the books that really connected with you on an emotional and psychological level and usually they connected because of a character that you believed in, a character that you wanted to see survive, a character that you felt unhappy about, a character that you wanted perhaps to see a terrible end come to them because they'd done something awful. But you're engaged on an emotional level with the character. So, I believe the answer to the question how do you create tension is you write a narrative and you create characters in such a way that the reader has to find out what happens next to the character that they are emotionally engaged with, that they have made an emotional investment in. And for every single reader, it will be a different character. I think that is how you create tension by getting your reader to care on an emotional and psychological level about what happens to the universe and the people within the universe that you have created. I'm a research junkie and I read an endless amount of non-fiction and I do a huge amount of research when I write a novel. But I don't write a plan. I have no outline. I have no synopsis. I make three decisions when I write a book. I have a very simple statement of the type of book that I want to write, usually one sentence. This is the theme, this is the conceit, this is the story I want to tell. The second thing I decide is the time period and the location that it will take place. The third thing I decide, and the most important thing for me, what is the emotion that I want the reader to experience? If somebody reads a book and then they see it six months later, what emotion will they have invested in that material? The interesting thing is this. I can have a very definite idea of the emotion I want to generate. There is no guarantee that you will experience that emotion as a reader. In fact, you can give the same book to ten different readers and they will all read a different book because they will all interpret it emotionally and psychologically in a different way. But as long as you have a clear idea, it acts, if you like, as a guide for the direction you are taking with your story. You can make a decision as to whether or not a particular idea will contribute to increasing the quality of emotion that you want to create, or it will distract the reader from the quality of emotion that you want to create. Once I have decided or got a reasonably clear idea of the emotion that I want to create, then I start writing. And because I have no outline, and because I have no synopsis, and I really don't know where the novel's going to go, and I certainly don't know how it's going to end, I do the research as I work, because I don't know what I'm going to need to know tomorrow. I don't know what I'm going to need to know 
next week. When I get there, I may decide to take the character to a different city. I may decide to have the character get married. I may decide to have the character lose a child. And I research as I go. It's a very spontaneous and organic process. I've talked about this with other writers and they say, there's no way in the world that they could work like that. We're all different. That's just the way I work. It's not right. It's not wrong. It's just mine. But the research is a continual thing as the work progresses because that's the way it has to be because I don't know the full structure of the story. I draw from people in my own life, I draw from people I meet, I draw from people I read about and often I find myself in a situation where I have a character in a location or a situation and I ask myself if this was me what would I do? What would I be feeling? What would I decide? Um, how would I feel about the consequences of those decisions? For me, the most interesting thing to write about is the psychology of the human condition. And I write crime, not necessarily because I'm particularly interested or fascinated by crime, but the polar is one of the broadest and most expansive genres because you can write historical, romance, maritime. You can set a murder mystery on a boat in the 18th century. You can write in any country in the world that you like. You can have a murder investigation, a conspiracy, a kidnapping, a poisoner, a serial killer, all of this. The thing that it does for me, and I think this is where we sort of tie back into my childhood and my interest in film, specifically Hitchcock, is that even though every single novel I've written is very different from the last, and there is no series, there is no recurring character, there is one common thread that runs through all of them, which is an ordinary individual in an extraordinary situation. So with a murder, a kidnapping, a political conspiracy, this is an extraordinary situation into which I can place an ordinary human being like myself, and therefore give myself an opportunity to go, okay, if this was me, how would I feel? What would I think? What decision would I make? That's the common thread, I think, in films like North by Northwest and Strangers on a Train. Ordinary people, extraordinary situations. And it gives you the opportunity to, to write about the entire spectrum of human emotions, from despair and grief and loss, to boredom, to hopelessness, to enthusiasm, to joy, to serenity. It gives you that entire range, which is interesting to me, um, because it allows me to explore every aspect of human character. It's life. And if you have no interest in people, you have no interest in life. And if you have no interest in life, you have nothing to write about. I don't write books that are designed to get people guessing. I don't analyze, I don't think about it. I, I just want to tell a good story. Some people will read my novels and feel that they are, they are a, a human drama, drama human. Some people will read my novels and think that they're a love story. Some people will read my books and think that they are terribly violent. People can read the same book and have a different attitude. Some people can be tied up in the, the mystery of it and they want to get to the end to find out what's happening. Um, we each read the same book in a different way. Um, many years ago I went into the north of France and I met a journalist from Voix du Nord, a newspaper up there, and we met in a restaurant and he greeted me and said, you're the guy that writes a slow motion thriller. Because I write a thriller, but it's character development and it's background and it's history and it's research and it's politics and it's culture. There is a mise-en-scene. There is not just there was a murder, now there's a detective, and he's doing this and he's doing this, and then I don't write like that uh, because that's not what I do. So I don't make an effort to create a mystery. I think different readers interpret the novels that I write in different ways, and some people could feel that they were mysteries, but I think the most, most readers read them and appreciate them because of the journey, not the destination. 
I, I never try and write a clever denouement. I hate coincidences. I, I don't like detectives who always have the right answer. I don't like um, the secret clue that nobody... I don't like this kind of thing because I don't feel that it reflects real police work and I don't think it reflects real life. I write daily. I never read what I wrote yesterday. I write and write and write until the book is finished. And then I leave it for two or three weeks and then I go back to the beginning and I read through it and I change things. I might find that I've repeated myself unnecessarily. There are things that need to change in the basic plot because now I know the end, which I didn't know at the beginning. And I work through it and it maybe takes three, four, five days to work through it and fix things. And then I'm done. I send it to my editor. My editor then might come back and say, I feel that this is not clear enough, or I feel that perhaps this is a particularly interesting thing and I want you to write some more about it. My editor will make suggestions. My editor never says, you have to do this. We have a very uh, amicable relationship. But she's usually right, because she's the first person who's reading it as a reader, truly as a reader, with an objective viewpoint. However hard you try, it is often difficult to read your own work as a reader and a writer. This is why I could never be an editor, because I read other people's work and I think I wouldn't have said it that way, I would have written it a different way, etc, etc. I think an editor is a very particular viewpoint and a very particular attitude. And I, I happen to have a really good editor who's very honest, she's very straight with me, she makes recommendations, they usually write, I accommodate those recommendations and then we're done. I've been asked this question before. The best answer I can think of is this. The worst book that you could write is the one that you think other people will enjoy. The best book that you could write is the one you yourself would like to read. Write about the things that interest you. Write about the subjects that you're passionate about, however curious and eccentric they may be. Why? Because your enthusiasm and passion for the subject will shine through in the way that you write. Also, it may take you two months or three months or a year, however long, to write the book. If you're writing the book for other people about a subject that you think other people will enjoy that you don't enjoy, it will not be a pleasurable process. If you're writing about something that truly interests you, you can maintain that interest throughout the entirety of the work. I don't think, in all honesty, that something non-human can ever replicate the imagination, passion, ideas, motivation, spirit of a human being. Art elevates a culture. Art is the way in which you cross all language, racial and religious barriers. Art and aesthetics has a wavelength that is probably the closest you can get to the wavelength of the human spirit. Interestingly enough, read poetry in any language and it has the same physical wavelength no matter the language. That tells you something about aesthetics and it tells you something about rhyme and metre and poetry. Art is a reflection of the very best there is in human beings. That is something that can be never replicated, never even approximated by something that is not the human spirit.